So, I guess it's time to get to a sermon. So I'd like you, if possible, we're going to go way back into this book called the Bible. We're going to go back to the Hebrew scriptures, better known as the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 18, and I am going to give you enough time to find it on your app, on your Bible, whatever you've got, pull it out. If you don't, it's not up here today because my reading is a little bit different than the text. Um, and let me know, just give me an amen, hallelujah, when you get there. Deuteronomy 18, and then we're going to go down to verse 15. That's where we're going to start. Ah, all right. A prophet from among you, from your own kin, like me, shall the majestic one your God raise up for you. You all shall heed such a prophet. This according to everything you asked of the mighty God, your God, at Horeb, otherwise known as Mount Sinai, on the day of the assembly when you said, not again to hear the voice of the Holy One of old, my God, or this great fire we see again lest I die. And God said to me, they're right. They've spoken the truth. I'll raise up for them a prophet like you from their own people. I'll tell them what to say, and he will pass on to them everything I command. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for all those who've been gathered here today, whether in their presence in this space, Lord, this physical space, or out in the virtual world, Lord. Bless them, God, right where they are. Allow their spirits to take flight, Lord, in this word. I've been carried to this space, Lord, for this exact moment, for this exact purpose to fulfill the call of the divine. I'm rooted and covered by the great oak trees that are my ancestors. Orinthia, Ida, Imogene. I am all that they are. I will let their light shine. God of all, please call forth in me that which you want to be offered. Let your presence be known. Let your spirit be felt and let your love transform us in this very moment and all the next. Amen. So I'm going to try to keep it real, real, y'all, because it's been some hard things going on in life. And um, I am amazed that I am standing here today. Never in my life have I ever been more frightened to stand in this place. It comes with such a great responsibility. And I am going to use my notes because I had COVID last summer, like many of you, and my brain waves forget things, and I don't want to have you all running in 15 different directions. So I'm going to use my notes a little bit. But I'll try to make sure I'm keeping you all engaged and staying with you all. So there's an inordinate amount of pressure when you get to this place. You got to get all the right words right. And just like Pastor T said, you feel like you have to come up and entertain do a dance, get the people up, keep them moving, keep them inspired. I mean, it is serious business to try to figure out what God wants the people to hear. And unfortunately, pastors, ministers, leaders, they're always scrutinized just by the last thing they said or did. They're judged in very critical ways. But God said, God would send a prophet like you. I don't really think I know a single pastor that I've met, and I've worked with many in our social justice work, including Pastor McBride, who was just like, hey, I want to be a pastor today. Uh-uh. This is always a wrestling, ditto, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and a struggle to get here, Sloan, um, because <laughs> you don't always want to have this kind of responsibility. I am more nervous than anything to lead people in the wrong path. The spirit of people are critical. Everything we say and do affects everyone. So as a young girl, my mother said, so I'm from Jamaica, um, 
when I was coming from Jamaica to Boston. She said, I was dancing and singing in the aisles on the plane. I was shocked. Um, she said, you know, you were just dancing around, talking to everyone. Do you guys remember a time when you can do that on the plane, though? Like, it was fun to get on a plane. You were excited. You were meeting people from all over the world. It was exciting. I used to love to get on the plane, not so much anymore. <laughs> So, you know, you'd stand in the aisles and you'd holler at your family all the way down on the back of the plane. Hey, nobody really got mad. They were just happy to try to, you know, try to get someplace. But somewhere along that flight of life, what I remember most in my child was being incredible, as a child was being incredibly shy, quiet, always internalizing things, very non-confrontational. All the conversations happened in my head. Confident about what was going on in my head. I knew it was good, but I didn't vocalize a lot. I was that kid who went to school the first day and sat in class in dread when the teacher would make you go around and say your name. Anybody feel me on that? Anybody? Okay, so good. I'm not alone. I know there's some people here who don't feel that way, but I was that person, shy. If people came to the house, I don't want to talk, I'd just go sit in the room. That's kind of my life at church, actually. I'd come and sneak in the church, sit in the back, and sneak back out. <laughs> if I didn't have to talk to anybody, I was real good with that. <laughs> but every time I knew an answer to a question and I didn't raise my hand, I felt my breath get trapped inside of me, like it was suffocating me. The challenge of speaking in front of people carried on into my college days, my earlier college days, because I'm still in school. <laughs> um, but as a requirement for a general education degree, you have to take a speech class. Anybody feel me on that? Everybody, no, everybody, is everybody, okay, so I had to take a speech class, and what you have to do is you have to, at some point, get up and make this presentation in front of everyone. Usually it was at the end of the semester, you got up, you know, you did your group exercises at first, you did your work plan, you did it all, you got it together. And like every good student, I made it through the very beginning of the semester to the end and dropped class because I did not want to make that presentation. So I have a whole bunch of W's on my old transcripts. They call them withdrawals, I call them wellness. <laughs> That was good for me. And so now I'm in divinity school <laughs> and I am here because this is a requirement. I haven't quite understood where God is calling me yet, but I have to do a sermon and I didn't drop out of class. <laughs> so when I tell you there's nothing but the grace of God that I'm standing here, you just don't even know. God is no joke, but God got jokes. So in, let me get back to De Deuteronomy. And, you know, you may leave here with more questions than you have answers, and that's good. Because God is a mysterious God. I have no idea why I'm here yet. But I'm here, and my heart is here, and you're here. A God is a mysterious God. So let's go over that text, and let me explain what's happening in that text. So Moses is the person that's speaking in that text. And it's just after the people have left the land. Uh, they've, been, they've left the e Egypt, right? Uh, Moses carried them out of Egypt. And, you know, the people were a little bit nervous about God because um, when they were acting up, you know how we act up. Like, God was like, I'm a free, y'all. I'm going to set you free. But then they got free, and they were, like, wilding out. And they were wilding out so much that so God gave us the Ten Commandments. And you know, if you read the scripture, when God set down the Ten Commandments, he wasn't like, oh, y'all, you know, just get some act right. He was like, no, y'all tripping. Sent down the fire, the brimstone. And they were scared, like scared, scared. So when they said, it was the people who were like, uh-uh, I don't want to hear from God like that again. Because if I do, I will die. So God was like, okay, wait a minute. Okay, you know, it, it says right here. He said, you know, the people write. I was, I was kind of hard on them. So you know what? Instead, I'm going to send someone like you, Moses, that can talk with me and communicate to the people. 
someone the people can hear a little bit more clearly. Someone that won't punish them and make them feel afraid to be who they are. I mean, that's pretty cool, huh, God? God was like self-reflective, real self-reflective, like, oh, you know, I I was a little hard on them people. Let Let me find somebody who can talk with them. So I don't know about you, but have you ever been, like, when you were younger, did you want to go over to your, like, friend's house? And, and when you, before you went over, you call them, you were like, hey, who's home? Is your mom or your dad home? And if they said, like, oh, your mom or your dad, they're like, oh, no, I ain't coming over because moms be tripping. <laughs> I don't want to come over there because mom is tripping. Well, my, son, my grandson said that the other day. He's like, mom, grand, uh, uh, grandma. Uh, Dad be tripping. He scares everybody away. And my son just gave the sly smile that he does and was like, "Mm mm-hmm, good. (laughs) So my question to you is, what is a prophet? You know, we often think of prophets as these perfect people, like ministers and preachers and pastors, because we expect them to be perfect, very unfair. But the two words in the Hebrew Bible used in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, I should say. The first word is Navi, the one who sees what is coming. It doesn't say how the person knows how it's coming, but they see what is coming. The other word is Shose. It's translated as seer. And it also comes from the vision of seeing the future. A prophet is one who utters divinely inspired revelations, assumedly from God. So what is a prophet? A spokesperson, someone who speaks on behalf of God. And that's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of words that you might hold inside because you want to be careful about what you say. So several months ago, a friend of mine preached, Reverend Rob, about prophets, and he named that, you know, some of his aunties were prophets. And then I wrote a paper expanding on that. I have some great prophets in my life. So we think about prophets as like, you know, hey, uh, you're going to get a new car tomorrow. And you're like, what? And then tomorrow your car breaks down, and you're like, oh, dang, I got a new car. I got to get a new car. That's what we think about when we think about prophets. But I've got some prophets in my life, Angie, Diane, Pastor Tanisha, who see me, who see you. And what they see when they see you is they're calling you into something you haven't quite yet seen yet in yourself. That's what a prophet is. And they keep reminding you They keep telling you they love you. They keep saying you're beautiful, you're powerful, you can sing, you have a voice, you can dance, you can praise, you can make it through that surgery. Those are our prophets. Not like me when I tell my son, we're having KFC tonight, and he's like, how do you know that? I'm like, because you're about to go get us some KFC. (laughs) So... In the Yoruba tradition, oftentimes when the babies are born, they wait a period of time before they name the child. And they wait so that they can assess the spirit of that child before they name the child. Because they understand how critical giving someone a name is. Speaking over them. Seeing them. My math. Uh, teacher in seventh grade, Mrs. Terry, the only African-American female teacher in my entire junior high school, pulled me aside one day and she's like, you're great and gifted at math. Today, I still use that as my primary source of income. Now, there are some things that people tell you about yourself that you shouldn't believe. And I'm just going to leave that there for now. So in the Bible, we know of some great prophets. There's Deborah, one of my favorites, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and, you know, JC, Jesus himself. 
best there ever was. And we have our modern day aunties. But I want to ask you, God said, I am going to send someone like you to hear me better. Who better could God send than you? How are you spending your time with God? I want to offer that you might be the prophet that God has sent. Not just for everyone else, but the prophet that is going to see into yourself. The prophet that is going to see into you. So how are you speaking to yourself? And if you're not speaking to yourself, what has suffocated your voice? What did it? What has shut your air inside of you so that it is suffocating you? Is it a world that doesn't see you because you live within the LGBTQ community? Is it because you're a black woman, a woman, a man? Is it because you walk differently, you dance differently, you look differently? Every single time they say words, they are suffocating you pressing down your voice inside of you, stifling you. You're eating your words and the pressure is just building and building and building inside of you. So I want to tell you a little bit about one of my favorite people who lived in history. Her name is Vivia Perpetua. And if I ever preach again, it's going to be about her. But I'm going to tell you about her. She was a Black woman, she's not in the Bible, but she is historically accurate. She lived about 203 years after Christ. She was 22 years old and a noble woman, married, raised with what you would call privilege. And at 22, she was apprehended by all her persecutors. You know, they, you know back then, you couldn't just walk into the church and say you were a Christian. There were no churches, first of all. They were just gathering wherever they could just so they could praise, sing, and pray together. Her mother, her father were with her, her brother, and some other Christians, and her newborn baby that she was still nursing. Her father begged her to denounce that she was a Christian because they were all going to get persecuted. They were all probably going to die, be punished, tortured. And she said to her father, she said, Dad, do you see that vessel lying there on the table? It's just a pitcher to drink out of. She said, can you call it by any other name? And he said, no, I see it to be so. And she said to him, can I be called by any other name but a Christian? That's how I want to speak into my life. That is how I want to speak into your life today. That is the kind of conviction I want you to speak into when you wake up every single day. You are your own prophet. You are the one that God sent. But my second question for you is, what happens when you do lose your voice? Moses was not a great speaker, hello, <laughs> I feel him. But they said, you know, he burned his lip or his tongue. They're not really quite sure what happened. That's kind of how they've translated the text. And so he stuttered or just had a heavy tongue. But when God put breath in Moses' body, the words came out. He led those slaves out of Egypt spoke powerfully, but you know, not everybody agreed. 
if you recall. Because even when you're speaking into yourself, if God is giving you the vision, it's yours. Everybody won't see it, but you got to keep pushing anyway. Now, how many parents have said to your children, you know, just be quiet. Just to still be quiet. I mean, think about that, how that translates to a child year after year after year. Be quiet. Silence your voice. Don't speak now. Wait till later. We have to start speaking something different into our children so their voices are not constantly being crushed and suffocated. Some of our kids are molested, hurt. Some adults are carrying that into their years of many. Because, and they can't even speak of it. They can't talk about it. So you need to sit and wrestle with God so God can give you that breath. Do you guys know how your vocal cords work? Yeah? So I'm going to tell you anyway, just in case you didn't know. So your vocal cords require air to come in, and they have to vibrate. And when they vibrate, it pushes the sound out. With God, God can push that air in so it can vibrate and push the sound out, push the voice out of you so you can speak over yourself. Now, you won't talk the way you used to talk. You're going to speak a whole new language when God starts breathing life into you. You become a prophet like you've never heard before. You become a preacher like you never knew you could be. You begin to speak words that nobody's ever heard. And in speaking, you start to free yourself. And when you free yourself, guess what happens? You start to free everybody else because then their voice, they know it's possible to speak up. They know it's possible to speak out. You might get persecuted. You, people might not understand. Sometimes people just can't understand what God put in you. They can't understand the words that God gave you, the vision that God gave you for the more, for the overflow. So instead, they tell stories. They make up lies because they, they just can't figure it out. They can't figure out why you would do what you did, why you would say what you said, why you hoped for liberation for everyone. Because when you do speak, it gives others permission to speak. We know it. Black Lives Matter. Look at what happened with George Floyd. They stood on his neck. They kneeled on it and pushed the air out. He could not speak. But that video pushed us all around the world. We got up. We protested. We spoke for those who couldn't speak. That is what we're called to do. So here's the hard part. When your air gets stuck inside of you, and we should know this from COVID, when your air gets trapped inside of you, it needs to go through this process, through your lungs. But if it gets trapped, it turns into poison. And it slowly kills you. You suffocate. So you, 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 me, the way we get those things out of us, we need to commune with God. We need to feel the breath of God moving through us. We need to allow the vibrations to shake and quiver in our voice so that we can start saying the things that are hard. You might have to even tell on yourself. You might have to speak out on some things. You might have to speak about mass incarceration. That's a prophet. Don't you want to be that prophet who says, we're going to end mass incarceration? Don't you want to be the prophet that says, we're going to claim LGBTQ rights. We're going to get women's rights back. 
Don't you want to be the person who speaks over your kids and watch them become lawyers and doctors and preachers and people who love completely in our whole? Be a prophet and you can't be a prophet nowhere. Be a prophet in your home. But here is my favorite part. And trust me when I say when I'm speaking to you guys, I'm not preaching and talking at y'all. Talking about myself too. I need you to know that. That's what I mean by keeping it real. You see, I have no shoes on. I need to stay grounded. Sloan don't like it, but I got to be barefoot. Even when you still can't say your own name, God will. God will say your name for you. God will call you into places that you wouldn't even imagine. God will speak over you and send somebody else. God will get you into the master's degree program. God will get you into the pastorship. God will get you into the church. God will make you a dancer no matter how old you are so you can praise God. God will get you into that program in Boston. God will heal you. God will touch you. Dad, God will bless you. You're running the lake. He had surgery not too long ago. God can do. God will speak your name for you. Even when nobody else sees you, God sees you. God will speak into you. God will call you. God sees you. I see you. And we need to spend more time seeing each other. We need to allow people, teachers, pastors, poets, the space to be honest, tell truths that are hard, love each other more clearly and deeply. We need to tell on ourselves over and over again so we can stop believing the lies. We are prophets so I'm just going to close up and say if you never see me preach on a podium again <laughs> you remember who God is to you you are the one that God sent for you you are the one that God sent for this nation. You are the one that sees into the lives and the future of this world. You hold that because God sent a prophet like you.